at Bethany. We're going to be in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Just to set this up just a little bit, in chapter 11 is where Jesus rose Lazarus from the, from the grave. He tarried where he was when he found out that he was, that he was, uh, that he was sick, and he allowed him to die. In fact, when he got there, he had already been dead for four days. And y'all know how that story goes, that uh, Jesus went to the grave and he told him, Lazarus, raise, raise up or come back. Or, or, I, I don't remember exactly what he says. But he commanded him. And he, and he mentioned Lazarus because if he just said, rise up from the grave, a whole dead gun with cemeteries all over the world would have just give up. Their, their, they're dead. But, uh, but anyway, this is a what after. This is after that, okay? Because shortly after that, then the, the, the Pharisees, they got pretty hot. In verses 45 through, through the, uh, the, the balance of chapter 11. And they decided to kill Jesus because there were so many people following him. And that's the reason they wanted to kill him. So they were kind of waiting. They put out spies all over, you know. So if you see him, let us know so we can go get him and accuse him and pretty much just kill him. You know, it wasn't his time yet. It wasn't his time yet. So none of that was going to work. None of that was going to work at all. But this is, uh, in, ver in chapter 12, it says it's six days. In fact, uh, verse 1 and 2 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at, at Bethany, where Lazarus lived whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given, was given in Jesus' honor. The other Gospels say it was at, uh, one of them says that it was a Pharisee's house. The other one, the other two Gospels, there's two other Gospels that say it was uh, at Simon, Simon the leper's house. So I'm not sure exactly. It gives you an impression here that it was in, that it was in uh, Lazarus' house. I'm not going to go there because I don't want to. It doesn't didn't really say that it was at his house. Amen. But he was present. He was there, and so was Martha, and so was Mary. <clears throat> but at this at this supper, man, what a what a meal it must have been. You know, the Jews from from all over were were, were thronging the, the the streets outside, competing for a, a glimpse of the resurrected man. Amen. I know were tons of them out there. Tons of them out there. They just wanted to see. I just want to see that guy. We know he was dead, and he was dead four days. Jesus going back to the to life. I need, I need to see him. I want to see him. But inside the house, it says that uh, Lazarus sat down at the table with him, meaning Jesus. Because it was in his honor, Jesus' honor. Now Martha. She was busy as ever. She's bustling away in her kitchen. Her old spirit of criticism gone. And Mary, as always, was at the feet at the master's feet. The picture has the uh, has three scenes: the picture of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And the focus of the story, of course, is on what Mary was doing, on her gift. Her, her gifts of worship to our Lord, to the Lord Jesus. So let's look at these three scenes. Let's take Lazarus first. Lazarus witnessing. Look at verses two. The, uh, the end of uh, verse two it says Lazarus among, among those reclining. I'm going to say while Lazarus among was among those reclining at the table of, of uh, with him. Verse nine says. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out, found out that Jesus was, was, was there and came, and came not only to see, uh, to, because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And then at the end here, verse 11 says, and verse 11 says that uh, for on account of him, meaning Lazarus, many of the Jews we're going over to, to Jesus and putting their faith in Him. From the moment that Jesus rose Lazarus from the grave, 
He became a witness. He became a witness. Whether he wanted to be or not, he was a witness. People were coming all around just to see this man that had been risen back to life. You know, when I was, when I uh, became known that I had uh, brain cancer in 2016, January 15th, I think it was, they, uh, they operated on me and they removed that tumor. And then we ended up in uh, Cancer Treatment Center of, of America in Illinois. That's where God led us to there uh, for treatment, where I went uh, under, went 45 days of chemo, and uh, which is pill form, wasn't bad, never got sick, and radiation. God healed me through that surgeon taking the tumor out, and through the radiation, the, the miracle of modern medicine. Amen. He healed me then. But in 2017, a couple of spots showed up on the MRI because I was taking MRIs right and left, man. I was taking a bunch of them. Sometimes three and four years, I think it started out being that. And then, uh, but those had a few spots that came back. This is about the size of maybe a one, two, three millimeters. It's very, very little, very small spots. And, uh, So they weren't just real concerned about that because they weren't growing or anything like that. They just kind of showed up. They were keeping a, an eye on them. But then another one, uh, one of my MRIs that I, that I had, showed a little bit bigger spot. And the next time I went, it was even bigger. So they were concerned. In fact, they were talking about possibly just uh, keeping me there and just doing uh, brain surgery on me again to remove the, the, little, the spots, the tumors, before they get out of hand. Because the cancer that I had was a glioma. Ali, Ali God and gliomas was the name of it. Notice that God was in the middle of it and in. God ends the cancer, and he did. The next time it would come back, they said it would probably be a, blast, a blastoma, which is a very aggressive brain cancer. It would move very fast. And uh, if they didn't keep an eye on it, I could, I could die pretty quickly. In fact, most people who have brain cancer like I did, it comes back within three years and they die. I mean, they, lose, they, they finally, they die after about three years. Well, it's been six years for me. Amen? Amen. But anyway, my point is, is that it was a bad situation. I was fixing to have to have brain surgery once again and probably go through chemo and radiation again. And the day I was, uh, the, uh, the, the Sunday before I was supposed to fly down there, me and my wife, and uh, have, have another MRI to see the progress of it to determine whether I was going to have open, I mean, brain surgery again or not. That Sunday, the elders came up here with anointing oil, and I don't have it, yeah, I have it right here. I believe in anointing oil. I believe in lay, laying on the hands, and I believe in, in anointing with oil for, for, and praying. I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. So the elders came up, and each one of them just took a little, that's what you did, just a little, you don't got to drown somebody in it, just a little bit. And you touch them. It's an act of faith and obedience and submission before God. Well, they started praying for me. And my head was bowed and I was down. In fact, I think I was facing this direction. And I'm not sure if I was on my knees. I don't remember. But I know that when, we, when they finished praying for me, I stood up and everybody in the church was up in the front and they had their hands stretched out and they were touching me as best they could. Because you guys prayed for me. When I went there, that, that I think it was Tuesday, it was usually on Tuesday that they do the uh, do the test on me. They did an MRI and it came back that it was gone. The cancer was gone. Even the two spots that had popped up before, it was all gone. So guys, 
from that moment, that moment, I'll be playing the game of witness for God of His miraculous healing. That He is still in the business of miracles. Amen? So like Lazarus, Lazarus was a, he was a witness. Amen? He was a witness. I mean, all of those throngs that were right there, they were there to see Him. And that's the end right there, but uh, what, what it says is they were upset because people were following Jesus because of that. See, that's what the witness is. We lead, we witness to people by our lives, and we lead people to Christ. Amen? That was a weak amen, I tell you. Amen. <laughs> Jesus resurrected him. You know, in the beginning, if you go back to the beginning, God uh, told Adam and Eve, if you eat of the fruit in the center of the garden, the, which is uh, the knowledge of uh, good and evil, then you would die. The devil, serpent came and lied to him and said, hey, he ain't going to die. And they ate, and they didn't immediately just fall dead. So they said, well, look here. God probably he wouldn't tell us the truth. At that moment, Sin entered man, and we became, became dead in our spirits. The Bible says that we are walking dead. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. Amen? Guys, a Christian, they experience two resurrections. One resurrection, the first resurrection is when... God gives us life in our spirit once again. We're risen from the dead of the death, the death of our sin. We're forgiven. We're given Christ's righteousness, His holiness. Amen? Amen. So it's a form of resurrection. My, point, my question is this, you know, Lazarus was risen from the dead and he, he led people to Christ because of that. What have you done? with your resurrected life. Amen? What are we doing with this precious life that our Lord has given us? Right? So let's look at Martha now. Martha working. The first part of verse 2. And it only says two words about it. Martha served. Martha had a servant's heart. She had a servant's heart. She was busy all the time. You know, she reminds me of my wife's mother, my mother-in-law. She's like that. She has a servant's heart. Man, you go over to her house and she just she'll just start cooking. And she's gonna get she gonna put food in front of you, but here, eat this. <laughs> we can't go over there without sir said giving my wife something said, put this in your car. I mean, she just has a servant's heart, you know what I'm saying? Well, Martha had that too. But Martha kind of got crossways with her sister back in Luke. Let me find it. It's Luke, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 40. And this is the instance where uh, Martha was busy in the kitchen and Mary was at Jesus' feet as usual. She was at his feet. And she was upset. She was, uh, she was getting mad. And she told Jesus, says, Ain't you concerned about her that, that, that I'm having to do everything around her? She's just at your feet. She's just sitting there. Tell, make her come help me. And Jesus told her, Martha, Martha. When Jesus says your name twice, guys, you better be listening. Martha, Martha. She's chosen the better thing. It's always best to to sit to be at the foot of Jesus, feet of Jesus, than being all busy bodied around, guys. God's not impressed by what you're doing for him. He wants to do something in you. Amen? That's his goal. And in order for that to happen, we've got to spend some time at his feet, at the master's feet. Amen. But she just worked and she just going and beat the band. And she was upset back then. And I wonder, 
What's the difference? Because she was indignant then, boy. She was mad. She was angry. But this time, in in uh, in our passage here today, in in John chapter twelve, she's not. She's calm. She's easy. That spirit of conviction just left her. So I wonder what happened. What has happened? It could have been what Jesus said, Martha, Martha. It could have been that, that. It could have been that she's still on, on cloud nine because her brother had been risen from the, from the dead. Jesus rose him to life. But I think we can find our answer, at least I believe this. Before Jesus rose Lazarus, her brother, from the, from the dead, he had a conversation with her in chapter 11. And I'm going to begin in verse 23. Now I'm going to go to 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you were here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will, will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, See, she believed that Jesus could raise him from the dead. It wasn't just miraculous for her. I mean, she knew it. She knew it in her heart. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again uh, in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said these most famous words. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, uh, me will live, even though he, is, he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said, Yes, Lord. She told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. I believe that's what changed her. She realized who he was. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what changed her. That's what took that spirit of, of, uh, of, of uh, just, I said it earlier, just being critical of, of everything and losing that and just being content in her own self. You know, she's probably singing and, and stuff like that in that kitchen, doing what she loves and just realizing and quit worrying about what everybody else is doing like that. But Martha had a servant's heart. Are we being critical like that with others? I know we do. Don't lie. You know you do. Maybe we need to have an epiphany too like Mary had. I mean Martha, excuse me, Martha had. Maybe Jesus doesn't need to say, Bob, Bob, what are you so upset about them for? Man, just, just worry about your own self. That ain't about you. Amen. You want to sure enough quench the Holy Spirit, that's a good way to do it. Be critical about other people to the point that you're no use to God. Amen. It's so easy to get busy too in a ministry. You know, doing things for God, as I mentioned before, that, uh, you know, Mar Martha, she was as busy as, as, as she could be. She thought she was working for the Lord. But guys, it can, we can, end, it will, we, if we're not careful, the ministry will become our God. When the ministry should be from God and in God, but if our focus is on the ministry, then it takes away from God. And like I said, it's a good way to, to quench the, uh, the Holy Spirit. So finally, let's look at uh, the last scene, and that is uh, Mary worshiping. It's going to be verses 3 through 8. I want you to look at Mary's devotion to Jesus. First of all, it was, it was revealed in, in, in verse 3. Let me get back a little to it. Verse 3 says, uh, 
Then Mary took took about a pint, and the other uh, the other gospel say an alabaster of of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on the, on Jesus' feet and wiped it and, and wiped his feet with her hair. One other time she says she cried, wiped his feet. One of the the other gospel says she cried on his feet and dried them with her hair, and then anointed his feet with the perfume. One other one says he anointed his head and his feet with the perfume. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. When she put that oil on Jesus' feet, it drew everybody's attention to it because the aroma of that perfume. Amen. Amen. That was her worship to him. That was her gift of worship, was that perfume. And it was a sweet smell. Guys, our worship of Jesus should be a sweet aroma to a lost and dying world. Amen. But then we're going to face, look at, uh, in her devotion to Jesus, she was also rebuked. Look at verses 4 through 6. But one of the disciples, and one of the, the other gospels say, one of the other gospels says, the disciples, not just Judas, but they, a, a lot of them were, were upset. It's almost like Judas was getting everybody ginned up. Amen. But he says, but one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray, G, uh, to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a, a year's wages. He did not say this because, it, because he, was, uh, he cared for the poor, about the poor. But because he was a thief, as keeper of the money bag, he used to, uh, to help himself to what was put into it. When we worship Jesus, we will probably face rebuke. The devil is still at work in this world. And he is upset when he sees us worship in the, in the marketplace. Guys, he ain't got a shot here in his church. Amen? There's too much Holy Spirit when, the, when the, uh, God's uh, temples gather together in his church. Amen? But when we're out there in the world and we're doing His ministries, that's when we're going to face persecution. Amen? I mean, you look at it right now. I, I, I see in the news all the time where our Justice Department is not protecting... Uh, uh, now, they will protect abortion clinics. They will do that in a minute. But they're not protecting, they're not pursuing those who are uh, uh, torching... The, the pregnant crisis centers. Those who believe in, in life. Helping women. They're not doing that. See, because they're being persecuted. They're being rebuked, if you will. That's what's going to happen if we step out there, guys. We're going to face rebuke. Amen? But oh, look at the reward, though. Verses 7 and 8. Jesus says, Leave her alone. Jesus replied. It was intended that she should, should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will, you, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. I like that he said that you will always have the poor among you, but will you not always have me. There's going to be time for ministry all the time, guys. But you better make time. We had better make time to be at the feet of our Lord in the midst of that. That's the most important thing. Amen? And I'm a firm believer too, guys. If, you, if we just submit to God, we make ourselves available to Him, He will take care of the works. He will provide the works for us. 
Amen? But Jesus stood up for her. Let me tell you something, guys. He is your advocate. He's not going to let anything bad happen to you. What's the worst they can do to you? This world? They can kill you. Amen? That's pretty bad. That's pretty... I mean, it's a, it's a one and done. You're, you're dead. You're gone. Everybody... Nobody wants to be killed. Amen? That's the worst this world can offer us. But guys, that's a, that's a graduation party for us as Christians. We get to go be with our Lord in heaven. You don't have to worry about persecution anymore. You don't have to worry about people like me preaching to you either. <laughs> There's no need because Jesus is there. He is the temple. He's there. We're in His presence. There's no need for, for us. For, for preachers any longer. There's no need for, for hospitals and ambulances and all of this stuff. There's no need for counselors because nothing's going to get you down anymore. Amen? See, at His feet, plans are made. At His feet, ministries are birthed. Amen? Amen? And at His feet we find comfort. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Jesus says, Come to Me, all, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I want to live such a life, and it starts and it begins and goes through and it ends at His feet. I get to heaven. I want him to say, I want to hear the words from Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. Amen. That's the reward. Amen. Jesus is in your corner. And I want to hear that. You know the the worst thing that I can have to imagine in life is just wasting my life as a Christian and getting to heaven and and Jesus is kind of just looking down at me, you know, just with a, a with a disappointed look. Guys, that would just I, that's the worst thing that I could imagine. Amen. Nothing in this world compares. <laughs> To something like that. Just like nothing compares to Jesus saying, Come on in, Bob. You did good, man. You're a faithful servant. Insert your name. Amen. I painted the scene so we should be. Our lives, because we, we have new life. The Bible says we're born again. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. And just like Lazarus, we're brought back to life. We should be witnessing like Lazarus. Amen? And like Martha, we should be, be busy. But guys, we should be content. Amen? knowing that we're applying our gifts for God. Amen? And then Mary, boy, she, that's the best, guys. We should always find time to be at the Master's feet. All the time be at His feet. Amen? That don't mean that you've got to get on your knees all the time. But you get in your, on your knees spiritually. Stay in that position so that you can hear from our Lord. You know, uh, as I wrap this up now, I want to talk about another Lazarus that uh, Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 16. He said there was a rich man, and he had everything he wanted, guys. He, I mean, he, had just, uh, uh, he just lived in luxury and, and just lavished, you know, in, uh, 
And there was a beggar outside his door named Lazarus. And he had sores all over his body and he would just, uh, he would just, he just dreamed about being able to, to eat the food that falls off of that, of that rich man's table. He said even the dogs came and they licked his sores. But then he died. Lazarus died. And the angels escorted him in to, to the side of Abraham. The Bible calls it Abraham's bosom. It's a place of rest. And the rich man died too. But he went to the place of tor torment. Hades. And he saw Lazarus across the, the way beside, uh, in, in Abraham's bosom. And he said, Father Abraham, Send your servant Lazarus over here and dip, to dip his finger in some water and put it on my tongue. Because I'm in this, this fire all the time. I'm in torment. So that might quench my thirst. And he told him, man, I can't... He's not going to come over here. It's, it, it, uh, there's a chasm right here between us. Y'all can't get over here and we can't get over there. He said, besides that, you've got... you know." Anyway... Then he said, uh, well, send, my, send Lazarus back to my house, to my father's house. i got five brothers that's going to end up where I'm at. Have him witness to them. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And he said, no, Abraham. No, Father Abraham. He said, if they see a dead man rise from the grave, and, and they see that dead man, then they will repent. And, G and Abraham said, even if they saw someone raised from the dead, they wouldn't repent. They wouldn't believe. I don't know if Jesus was putting these two together, but they sure fit. Because it says in verse 11 and 12, I mean, sorry, verse 10 and 11, it says, so the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Not just Jesus, but Lazarus too. We've got to get rid of all the evidence. For on account of him, many of, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. The Jewish people didn't, not all of them, but he had a good following right here. And let me say this, that right after this, he had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There, you ever wonder where those people came from? That's, that's where they came from. They witnessed him raising Lazarus from the dead and they were so impressed with him, they became believers. Followers of him. And, and that's, that's the folks that were laying down all the stuff in the, in the, the palm, on Palm Sunday, laying out all their cloaks and their palm branches out, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And by the end of that week, a lot of those same people were, were, were screaming out, crucify him, crucify him. Well, my point is that they didn't believe, even though they saw Lazarus raised from the dead. The Pharisees still did not believe. And a lot of the, uh, the Jewish culture, a lot of the Jews did not believe. Right now, even today's time, Jews, uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish religion does not recognize Christ as the Son of God. As the Savior, they're sure waiting for Him. I want to go back to the conversation that Jesus had with Mary, I mean Martha, excuse me, Martha, in uh, chapter 11. Before, just before she, he rose Lazarus from the grave. He said that I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives, lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus can raise you from the dead? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that He can give you life in your spirit, which is dead? You're dead in your trespasses and sin. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Because He's asking that question still today. Amen? Have you watching on Facebook or YouTube right now? I prayed earlier that God would touch that heart that's lost. 
See, because God places eternity into our hearts. He did it back in the garden. When we strayed from Him, He placed eternity in our hearts. When we go through our life knowing something's missing, and we got to fill it with something. We try many, many different things through our life. And we're left wanting. And then God draws us to His Son. And hopefully we turn to Him. We accept Him into our life. God got after me. He worked on my heart. He tilled up the, the soil of my heart and got it ready for His salvation seed. And it took root, 1983, Rockwell, Texas, Bethany Baptist Church. That's how it happened with me. I prayed that God would uh, touch the heart that's here today or maybe watching on Facebook or YouTube. This lost. You know, you, you feel like something's missing in your life. You just don't know what it is. Have you attained fulfillment in life? Christ. I'm going to say a simple prayer. And if you feel the presence of God begin to draw you to His Son, and I say this prayer, then pray the sinner's prayer. Father God, we love you so, so very much. Father God, as your servant, I'm asking at this moment in our service here today, that you would draw those that you're, you've been working on, that you get in their hearts ready for your salvation seed, that you would draw them to your Son at this very moment. If you felt that draw that I described earlier, would you say this prayer with me? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Right now, Lord, I turn from that sinful life. I agree, Lord, that you are right, that I am wrong, I want to do things your way. So Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart now. I receive you by faith into my spirit. I believe you died on that cross for my sins. That you rose back to life. You're living in me now. I recognize you as my God, my Lord, and my friend. And from this moment forward, Lord, I will serve you. Jesus, precious, precious name. Amen. You said that prayer for the first time. More importantly than that, maybe you said it before and it just didn't feel a change. But if you said that prayer this time and you felt the emptiness that you had begin to be filled, I need to talk to you if you're here in the church right after services. And if you're watching on YouTube, my number's right there or Facebook. You can also go on or just Google Racket J. Cowboy Church, Terrell, Texas. I'll bring up my contact information there. That is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. And I need to talk to you about it. Amen. Let's pray one last time. We'll get on out of here. Father, we love you so, so very much. Father God, Lord, I'm asking that you would lead us all this week in our morning time into a quiet time with you. Father, may we just spend time at your feet, Lord Jesus. Father, so you can guide us through the week. Lead us to someone that's lost or maybe somebody that needs some help. Father God, so that we can be your servant to a lost and dying world. We must take these things that we're learning and apply them to our lives. So we must be doers, not just hearers only. Father, I'm asking that you would do that for us. Lord, just to, until we can get back up for Thursday night for Buckout or next Sunday for services, we ask for your perfect speed in our lives. And Lord, we, we ask for your favor in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. All right, God, we love you. See you next week. <laughs>